I'm excited for you that you get to see this again. Crank up the volume ah! for the biggest event of the summer. Oh, come on. Ah! Guardians is laugh out loud funny. Exactly, you idiots. Oh, no. The perfect conclusion of the Guardians trilogy. It's good to have friends. It's the best Marvel movie since Endgame. So, that happened. <laughs> Drax, stay here with Rocket. Watch him. That's who they're coming for. I want to come. No. Mantis, watch Drax. Groot, you know what to do with these. down on it. What? Push it down. I am pushing down on it. Push the button. It looks like you're pushing the keyhole. The what? There's a button under the handle. Press that in. Okay. Now what? Open the door. That is a stupid design. And your instructions were very unclear. Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. Marvel released a bunch more Guardians of the Galaxy 3 trailer footage, which includes the first appearance of Quasar from the comics and the first F-bomb in a Marvel movie. So I'll explain what's going on. They also said that that F-bomb is going to be uncensored in the theatrical cut when you go see it in the theaters. They also just revealed more of the Guardians 3000 team, Starhawk's original Guardians of the Galaxy team. So if you're brand new to the channel, we're doing a giveaway for Guardians of the Galaxy 3 IMAX tickets. All you have to do to enter is just be a subscriber and post your favorite moment from the trailer so far on the video. But the real big thing here is the Quasar character. A lot of people wondering when they're going to do Quasar. It was revealed that this girl in the trailer that the High Evolutionary is experimenting on is actually Phyla Vell. Now there's a bunch of versions of Quasar in the comics, just like Captain Marvel, just like Nova. Like a lot of space-based characters pass the mantle down a couple different times. But Phyla Vell was important because she was Quasar during the Annihilation Conquest storyline, which is where this modern version of the Guardians of the Galaxy team that we see in the MCU came together for the first time. She also joined the Guardians of the Galaxy team in a later roster, just like Adam Warlock, who was also in that Annihilation Conquest storyline working with the Guardians. The uniforms you see the Guardians wearing in the trailer are also the same uniforms that they wore in that Annihilation Conquest storyline. So the movie just in general is borrowing a lot of Easter eggs and references from that Annihilation Conquest storyline. The other big connection too, like we just got the Marvel's trailer, Captain Marvel 2 with all those characters in a different part of space. This is like Marvel's other space-based franchise. Phyla Vell is also meant to be the daughter of the original Captain Marvel, mar -Vell. So there's a connection to the Marvels through her character. But as of me posting this video, I haven't seen the movie, so I don't know if there are going to be any cameos from the Marvels characters in this movie. The big difference with her character in this movie is that she's obviously much younger, and during that Annihilation story, she had already become Quasar, taking the Quantum Bands. Usually you don't take the mantle of Quasar until you're given the Quantum Bands. Another big connection to the Marvels movie through the Bengals and the Quantum Bands. They're meant to be relatively similar. There have been all these theories about Miss Marvel's Bengals, like where is the other Bengal? Turns out that it's being worn by Dar Ben, who's the main villain of the movie, and they just revealed in the trailer that they're basically the MCU version of the Kree Negabands. They're kind of like Green Lantern's rings. They can create constructs with them, which is how Miss Marvel can use them with her powers. Now, she's also a mutant in the MCU, like we're talking about X-Men Easter eggs here. So there's like something on top of that. The difference between the quantum bands of Quasar and the Kree Nega bands are that the quantum bands draw their power from the quantum zone, which is like an alternate dimension, and the Kree Nega bands draw their power from the negative zone, thus the name Nega bands. It gets a little confusing in the comics if you haven't been reading them for a long time, but in the MCU, they tend to simplify all those things. So don't worry too much about the particulars there. And in the trailer, it doesn't look like Phyla Vell has the quantum bands yet anyway. During the movie, it seems like she hasn't gotten her full origin story yet. And either she was created by the High Evolutionary inside the MCU, like she's one of his experiments in creating the perfect life form, or he captured one of mar -Vell's offspring and used them to create Phyla Vell. In the comics, she was actually the bioengineered super weapon, just this perfect being patterned after Genus Vell, the actual biological child of the original Captain Marvel, mar -Vell, and Elysius, his wife, she was an artificially created Eternal from the same planet Titan that Thanos came from. She was meant to be the same type of Eternal that Thanos was. Their son, Genus Vell, became so powerful as the next version of Captain Marvel. He was a Kree Eternal hybrid, basically, making him super powerful naturally, in addition to all the extra powers that he had as a new version of Captain Marvel. His mother, Elysius, decided to create another female copy of him, calling her Phyla Vell. And their names are meant to be references to Genus in Phylum. 
She has a bunch of different space-based adventures. It gets really complicated in the comics, like her backstory, the continuity is a little complicated. They tried to streamline that in more modern comics. She tries to fight her brother, Genus Vell, for the right to become the next Captain Marvel, but then goes off to have her own adventures. She becomes the new version of Quasar, which is what she's been for the most part in the comics. Then she goes on to have adventures with the Guardians of the Galaxy. Just because she's half Kree and half Eternal, she has this highly evolved body, like she was designed biologically to be the superior being. She can absorb and redirect energy, she has a low level cosmic awareness, and after she gets the quantum bands and becomes Quasar, she becomes super powerful. Most of the time in the artwork that depicts her that you see popping up all over the place, she's wielding the Oblivion Sword too, which is an extra huge power up she gains through her different adventures. She also has a long time connection to the Moon Dragon character who is Drax's daughter in the MCU. Even though they haven't done Moon Dragon inside the MCU yet, I think we'll learn more about Drax's backstory during this movie though. In the comics, Moon Dragon eventually also does work with the Guardians of the Galaxy when she gets older. But like I said, in the movie, it just seems like they're saying that the High Evolutionary created Philovel in his attempts to create the perfect life form. Like that's his whole thing is trying to create the perfect life. That's why he has all these human animal hybrids on this version of Counter Earth. He's trying to create the perfect version of life, just in general, life forms and the way that they live. Even though everything has that funny 80s shine to it, like everything looks like it's stuck out of time in the 80s with these weird animal human hybrids. I think what James Gunn is saying with the Philobel character is that potentially she could become part of a future Guardians roster, just like Adam Warlock could become part of the next version of the Guardians of the Galaxy, because even though they probably won't do Guardians of the Galaxy 4 as a movie, the team will come back with a different roster in future movies. And we get a much longer version of that funny scene of them trying to drive the car, Peter Quill not being able to because he doesn't know how to drive, he left Earth when he was 8 years old. And Nebula not being able to open the door because she's from outer space, like she hasn't actually experienced cars or technology like this before. But if you're a child of this era, like if you grew up during the 80s with cars that work kind of like this, you instantly recognize a scene like this, like it feels like a family trying to get in a car arguing with each other. Just get in the freaking car! Speaking of other Guardians of the Galaxy rosters, we see the rest of the Guardians 3000 team. Remember, they're all technically Ravagers in the MCU, so they're all on the same team, but the Ravagers organization itself is kind of like a loose collection of different factions. In Starhawk's team, Sylvester Stallone's character just happens to be made up of the original Guardians 3000 team from the comics, Yondu's original team. So all the characters from that team in Guardians of the Galaxy 2 are back for this scene, with a few exceptions like Michelle Yeoh's Alita Orgord. She was Starhawk's wife, but obviously now she's in the Shang-Chi movies playing a completely different character. You also probably notice though that they changed Martinex's face so that it looks a little bit more like Michael Rosenbaum in real life. If you couldn't tell in the first movie, that was Michael Rosenbaum. Kruger is back. He performs a similar magic trick to emote like he did in the second movie. He's a sorcerer just like Doctor Strange. They wield the exact same type of magical energy, which is why the color is the same. There's many different types of magic in the MCU. That's why different magic based characters have different colors of magic. Like Loki uses a different type of magic than Doctor Strange. That's why his is green, as does Scarlet Witch who wields chaos magic. That's why her magic is red. And the same with Agatha Harkness who wields a different kind of magic, which is why hers is purple. I love the way they have the mainframe character here just floating next to Martin X laughing with him. If you don't remember from the second movie, that was voiced by Miley Cyrus, who sounds like she might be back for this movie too, just because it's a really quick cameo scene it seems like. They also reveal that Nebula has wings during the movie, like she's gone full on battle angel with her new arm as well. James Gunn also revealed that Rocket is the person who gave her her new arm, probably as a thank you for giving him Winter Soldier's arm for Christmas. The other big thing too James Gunn just revealed is that the voice of Lila the Otter, Rocket's girlfriend from the comics, who's also from the same place he's from, is actually Linda Cardellini who also plays Hawkeye's wife in the other MCU movies in the Hawkeye series, Laura Barton, who they also recently revealed is a mockingbird of the MCU. That's what the whole subplot with the watch was about during the Hawkeye series. She is Agent 19 who is the mockingbird character, meaning that at some point she was also part of S.H.I.E.L.D. and that's how she got to know Hawkeye. But if you're a longtime James Gunn fan, you may remember that James Gunn wrote the Scooby-Doo movie. She played Velma in those original Scooby-Doo movies, so that's the James Gunn connection there. We think this is a brainwashing facility for an evil cult. Well, maybe this is the secret relic thingy they worship. She was coming back mostly because of that, not because she had been in the other MCU stuff as Hawkeye's wife. The other weird thing too is if you've been watching a lot of the press is that you may have seen that Kumail Nanjiani was at the premiere with James Gunn and everyone else. I don't know if that means that Kingo has a cameo in the movie, like are they doing Eternals cameos in the movie? 
The last we saw of Kingo in the MCU was during the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special for a couple Christmas movies that he had made that were being released, but before the events of that, he'd actually been taken from Earth with the other Eternals by Ereshkigal the Judge to judge whether or not Earth was worthy to continue existing. I'm not expecting a ton of Eternal stuff. Maybe there's a couple Easter eggs about stuff that's going on in different parts of the galaxy, though. The way James Gunn talks about the movie, mostly it's localized to just these characters and wrapping up all their storylines, which is why he's teasing so many other characters that were part of the Guardians of the Galaxy in different rosters. Like, oh, there are some characters in this movie that could wind up replacing some of these characters that are leaving or being killed off. Let me know in the comments, too, if you think any of the characters will die during the events of the movie. I don't think they're going to kill everyone off. I think that some people will survive and continue on. There's a bunch of other big trailers that are dropping this week, so make sure you enable alerts for my channel so you don't miss any of those. Everyone click here for my brand new Fantastic Four Adam Driver video, and click here for my brand new Deadpool 3 Wolverine and X-Force video. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.